take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And if you notice, the reading was verses 15 through 23. So we have lots to cover this morning. And we covered in a matter of three months, two months, two full months, verses 1 through 14. And so we're going to try to cover verses 15 through 23 in one sermon. So uh, we'll see how this goes. But um, again, first, or Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul is writing again here to this church and he's describing for them. And he's saying that how much I'm praying for you. I'm, he opens up this particular section. He ends his one sentence, his real long sentence from verse 3 to 14. And he opens up with a new very long sentence. This is all one idea. In verse 15, he is saying that he's heard of their faith and he's praying for them. And isn't it so encouraging when someone tells you that they're praying for you? Isn't that isn't that exciting? Isn't that encouraging? And when we spend some time before the service and we pray for needs, when we get together as a church body and we begin to pray for one another, what you're doing is you're you're going before the Lord and saying, God, this person is near and dear to my heart, and they may not pray for themselves, but I'm going to and so this church paul is saying i am praying for you he's praying for them so that ultimately they can come to the knowledge of this 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 fact that jesus is greater jesus is greater you see at the top of your sermon notes as as uh, daniel spoiled it for me but he's greater than what fill anything in that blank you can put anything you want and that greater than symbol says jesus is greater than that that i'm praying church that you understand this fact that jesus is greater he is great but he's also greater I can only think when we get to a passage like this, the song Majesty, it's an older song, I think it was written in the 1800s, but it goes, Majesty, worship his majesty, do you all know that? Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise, majesty, kingdom, authority, flow through his own unto his own his anthem raise and the song continues just talking about how majestic god is and all the praise given to god and that's what paul is doing here he's saying this is the reason why jesus is great for the offertory, pick the song uh, from the Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's right out of Psalm 34. And it's such a beautiful song because they took that psalm and put it to words. And if you want to talk about a scriptural song, that is one of them. Listen to what Psalm 34 says. The psalmist, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let it humble here and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together so what we're going to do is picture a large magnifying glass what does a magnifying glass do it magnifies what's on the other end of it and we're going to put a magnifying glass to this particular section of Ephesians and see how Jesus is greater Jesus is greater. We're going to first look at what Paul's prayer was so that they can see how Jesus is greater. And as we begin, let's look to verse 15, that Jesus is greater. And we often think that uh, through this prayer that Paul is saying uh, things that he's thankful for and what he's praying for them to do so they understand this. So let's dive right into this prayer. Verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, Paul is thankful for the the church's faith he's thankful for the church's faith as he's thinking about how great jesus is he is thankful that this church has the faith in that great jesus in that great lord and savior and this wasn't uncommon for paul to do in his letters he told the church of Colossae in verse 4 chapter 1 since we heard of your faith in christ jesus 
and the love that you have for all the saints. He's, he's edifying this church, and he's saying, this is what you're doing. Keep doing it. Church, keep having faith. Keep exercising your faith. Keep having the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, on and on you can see. And those are all evidence, evidence, as the song we just sang, uh, evidence of Jesus' workings in you. And we see even the evidence uh, of Jesus all throughout Scripture. And we see the evidence of Christ throughout us. And through our faith, we're living that out, saying, people around us, look to Jesus. See how he is great. And the church here at Ephesus is no different. Their faith, their faith. He also said to Philemon in verse 5, because I hear of your love and of the faith, faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Faith is that very foundation. Jesus Christ is that foundation. When we try to establish core values in our life, we think of integrity, we think of balance, we think of, of love and compassion and all this. Those are all just building blocks on what? On faith. On faith. And that's what Paul is laying out here. saying, this is what you're basing your Christianity off of. And I am thankful for that. I am thankful that you continue to exercise your faith in who? In the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not exercising the faith for themselves. They're not exercising it to build up their own church and their own body. No, they're saying Jesus is the foundation. He is our core value. He's the, the one that in which we build our faith, the rest of our faith off of, and that's Jesus Christ. He even encouraged the, the church in Rome, Romans 1 verse 8, first, I thank my God through the Lord Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith your faith is proclaimed in all the world. What a testimony. What a testimony. If the Apostle Paul could write the, uh, to, in, in, his, in his writing, and as smart as he was, if he could say something about Fulton Baptist Temple, would he say something like this? First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for Fulton Baptist because your faith is proclaimed in the world. What an awesome thing that, that would be written of us if Jesus could write that about us, if God could, could pen that same thing about us. And we looked and say, well, I don't know if we're there just yet. Whether we are or we're not, that's what our goal is. That's what we're striving to do. And that's what we're exercising our faith here in this community, around the world, with the different missionaries that we support. We're exercising our faith. Why? We're saying Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater greater he's not only thankful for the church's faith but secondly paul is thankful for the church's love look with me in verse 15 again for this reason because i've heard of your faith in the lord jesus and your love your love how important is this love that the church is to hold on to how important it is for churches to have that as part of their faith and exercising that out loving their own people loving their community, loving the world, and knowing that Jesus told his disciples, and same thing he told us, that that great commission, that we ought to um, spread the gospel and teach the gospel to all nations. And, uh, and that's all part of that love, saying, I love you. I'm going to uh, put you above myself. Remember our definition of love? Uh, you know, not doing what you want to do so that you do what God wants you to do, putting others above you. Love, that's what this church was doing. Although we're warned in Revelation where Ephesus eventually led to, and Jesus had some things to say against Ephesus, and I remind you out of Revelation 2, it says this in verse 4, but I have this against you, talking about the church of Ephesus, this whole paragraph is speaking on Ephesus, the church there, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So this love... Uh, the letter in Revelation was written probably 30 plus years after this particular letter. So this letter that the church at Ephesus received, eventually this same love they started to lose. Enough so that Jesus had to write to them and saying, listen, you abandoned that first love. Well, what love was that? You have fallen. You have abandoned that love. You've, you've decided to put yourself and, and that foundation that you once had of faith and, and uh, the, one of the evidences of it was love and that's beginning to crumble and fall. 
church at Ephesus, you need to restore that back. And Jesus even warned them, remember from where you have fallen. Remember that that pillar, if you will, of love. Remember how it's fallen. Repent, turn from that way and do the works you did at first. And then he gives them this stern warning. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What a warning to this church. And if they could just go back to this love that Paul is commending them for, he's saying, church, you've loved others. Your faith has has shown through this love and you've loved people. Paul was encouraging other churches, not here at Ephesus, but remembering uh, 1 Thessalonians, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. That church at Thessalonica, they were really exemplifying their love. And Paul is even saying, I don't even have to mention this, but I will commend it because you know what love is. You know what brotherly love is. You know how to love one another. You know how to love your church and love your people and love your community. And I don't even have to scold you on that like I did with some of the other churches I had to do. Paul may be thinking. The writer of Hebrews also writes this about the love. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. So even the the Hebrews that are reading this particular letter, the writer is saying the love that you have shown about Jesus, it's great. It's, It's pointing towards Jesus who is greater. First Peter never avoided this subject either. He writes, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And then also first John, one of the, one of the, the best books when it comes to love, first John four twenty one. And this commandment we have from him, from Jesus, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then he continues to warn that if you do not love God, if you do not love your brother, you do not love God. For how can anyone, you know, say that they love God and then hate his brother? We, we see that in scripture about loving the brethren. And that all stems from what? It stems from a foundation of faith. It stems from a foundation knowing that Jesus is greater. Paul dives in a little bit deeper with his prayer. Look with me now in verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Number one about this, you'll notice it's in a different font because it's, it's a twofold type of prayer. One, he begins thanking. He thanks God for this. And now he begins to, to encourage to this is what you now need to keep doing and do it even better yet. First, he says he's praying that the Lord may grant wisdom. Grant wisdom wisdom. These believers have already received the down payment. We looked at that last week with with the Holy Spirit. They are believers. They know the Lord Jesus. They will uh, inherit eternity. They will inherit the kingdom of God. And, And God says, as much as I am your inheritance, children of God, you are his inheritance. And we find that here in this passage coming up. And we see what a, wonderful, uh, what a wonderful group this is of being part of God's family. This wisdom is the deeper understanding. And, he's, and, and Paul is saying, I'm praying that the Lord may grant you this. This deeper understanding of God. And it comes by what? It comes through the Holy Spirit. We find in verse 10, or I'm sorry, verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is the one who grants this wisdom. He's the one that is with you. He is your comforter. He is your counselor. He is the one to give you this wisdom. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 11 verse 1 says this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this spirit, Holy Spirit, was resting on Jesus as he's living here and he's dwelling here and he's 100% God, but yet 100% man. And the Holy Spirit has prophesied saying that he is 
one with Jesus. And then John 14, verse 16, this is an amazing passage. It says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So here's the situation. The, the prophets prophesy that the Holy Spirit will be on Jesus. Jesus is now saying, children of God, I'm going to ask the Father. The Father is going to give you the same Holy Spirit, the same power, the same comforter, the same advocate, the same assistant, if you will, so that you can live your life. Why? So that you can be given the wisdom that comes only from God. This word helper in our Bibles, also it's translated as advocate. It's translated as comforter. It's also translated as counselor. So you see this deep connection that Jesus is saying with the Holy Spirit. He is there with you every single day. Every single day. You have a personal counselor with you each and every moment. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you say Jesus is greater, you have the Holy Spirit with you and you have him to comfort you, to counsel you, to be your advocate. You have him on your best days and also you have that same Holy Spirit with you on your worst days. And here Paul is saying, I'm praying that the Lord gives you this wisdom, gives you this understanding of the Holy Spirit because he is your guarantee. He is that down payment so that you can live a righteous and holy life until you, this old body of ours dies and passes away and gets buried into the ground. But yet our soul lives forever and ever and ever. And we were given the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. He is praying that the Lord may grant you wisdom. Secondly, part of this prayer, or point number four, you could say, he is praying that the Lord may give you revelation of him. Verse 17, what does this mean? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom first, and then of revelation in the knowledge of him. Revelation in this context is the unveiling of God to the readers his specific prayer for this revelation is that they will know god better and that the spirit would enable the readers to understand god's mysteries what mystery is that we saw that earlier that this mystery was revealed to these this people and that's jesus christ a mystery that was in the old testament has now been accomplished and revealed in the new testament and paul is saying i'm praying that this mystery, this revelation is given to you of Jesus Christ. What is this great mystery that Paul is praying? The end in view that the readers might gain greater knowledge of God. We see that in the following text, revelation in the knowledge of him. This word knowledge means exact means complete not just abstract knowledge of god or even facts about him paul's desire was to see this church have more knowledge about god so that they could be closer friends with god here's an awesome fact for you and i'm careful when i use that word awesome we we tend to just throw that word out there but when it comes to god god is awesome so reserve that word for him let's try to change our vocabulary and if you ever find me saying awesome about anything else but god please correct me because i'm really trying to be um, uh, careful about that because that word is reserved for god we see that throughout scripture anytime you see the word awesome is always an accompaniment with god or his actions or his deeds and so this is something that is truly awesome about him that he wants to be your friend do you know that you're a friend of God we find that in John 15 you are my friends if you do what I command you no longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you isn't that great Isn't that exciting how many of you have ever asked hey do you know so-and-so and then let's put a name in there. Let's just say, I don't think there's a Seth in here, right? I'm always trying to be careful. On, and if you are Seth in here, or if you're watching, I'm not talking about you. I'm just trying to think of a name in scripture. So I went through Adam. We have a couple Adams in our church. I didn't want to use Cain because it's a negative context. And, um, uh, and of course, his brother Abel. I didn't want to use Abel. So Seth, Seth is the next one. So th there's a reason why I chose Seth. Um, but anyway... So you get a little insight on how my brain works, which is kind of scary. So some of you say, oh, yeah, I know Seth. 
And then you may say, oh, hey, um, I want to do something for Seth since you know him. What's his favorite coffee shop? You start thinking, you're like, well, I don't really know Seth's favorite coffee shop. I don't really have that knowledge of Seth like maybe I thought I did. Am I really, you know, can I really be counted as Seth's friend or maybe I'm more of an acquaintance? Maybe I don't really know him as much as I should. Yeah, I've known him for years, you say. We go way back. But I don't really know his favorite coffee shop, so I, I can't really help you there. See how that goes with our earthly friends? If we do not know specifics of them, how well do we really know them? We know about them. We know who they are. We know kind of what they look like. Maybe some uh, strengths, weaknesses, whatnot. We know their name, at least. But we know nothing, what they like or what they don't like. The same goes with God. How often do we say, I know God's name. I know who he is. I know a few descriptions of him. I, but I know nothing what he likes or what he dislikes. So I continue just doing whatever I want to do because... I don't really know if God likes it or not. So are we really friends with God? We have a knowledge of him. We, we say, well, I'm a believer. I know who he is. But Paul is saying here, I'm asking that God reveals himself to you in the knowledge of him, in the ins and outs of God. And that's what, our, our, what we need to strive to do. We need to like what God likes. We need to hate what God hates. And we need to strive for holiness. Why? Because that's what God likes. That's what God wants of our lives. He's paid so much for you. What should we do and respond? We should at least try to know who God is. We should at least try to learn about our God and we should try to grow in him. Tom Constable says this, growth in knowledge is indispensable to growth in holiness. If we want to grow in holiness, we have to grow in knowledge. We have to know what God wants us to do. We have to know what God does not want us to do. Why? So that we could be holy. God desires that we be holy. Let's continue on. Verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints he's talking about you you are his glorious inheritance and paul is asking that their hearts are enlightened what does that mean the word heart not talking about this blood pumping vessel the heart to the hebrew was the seat of thought as man thinks in his heart so he is as the bible says heart it's not an emotion we use it more of a romantic emotional thing and valentine's day you have hearts everywhere but that's not what we're speaking of here scripture talking about the heart has to do with the mind where the will acts in response to truth i want your mind to be enlightened paul is saying i want your your uh, response to truth be enlightened so that when you hear the truth you respond to it when when sin is brought to the forefront of your mind you respond to it you repent to it you get back on track with god be, why because he's your friend he loves you and you love him you want to do what god wants you to do because you hate what he hates and you love what he loves why is he praying this he says, why? He says that, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That is what our prayer should be as we approach this text. Do you notice the two parts of his prayer? He began by thanking God and then he began by giving a challenge. So we do that same thing in our prayer. Again, you notice at the top of your outlines, you see the greater than symbol. So that was the introduction. That was 20 four minutes of introduction. So I have six minutes to get through points one through, there's two threes there, so enjoy that. You, Jesus is what? He's greater than everything. He's greater than everything. It would be heresy if we put a less than. If we put an equal to anything on that side, that also would be uh, irreverent. If we put God on that side, Jesus is God. God is Jesus. We see that in, in John 1.1. 1, 1. But Jesus is greater than 
everything. Evangelist Paul Washer makes this argument when a one college, young college student tried to tie him up on the authority of Jesus. The college student said this, how can one man suffering for a few short hours on a cross save a multitude of men, a countless multitude, according to you, from eternal judgment? Washer loved this, this uh, statement, this question. He responds this way. You want to know how that one man dying alone for a few short hours on a tree can save a multitude of men from eternity in hell? Because that one man is worth more than all of them put together. You take mountains and molehills, crickets and clouds. You take everything, every planet, every star, every form of beauty, Everything that sings, everything that brings the light, you put it all on the scale and you put Christ on the other side, Christ outweighs them all. It doesn't matter what you put on this side. Christ is greater. Jesus is greater. And when we look to the scripture, when we put our magnifying glass on this, this portion, this paragraph, we need to see that Christ is is greater greater than what follow through with me in this brief outline greater than death number verse 20 says this greater than death that he worked in christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places christ is greater than death he's greater than any earthly institution he's greater than the grave. Acts 2, verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That's your Lord Jesus Christ. It was not possible for God to be, Jesus to be bound by death. Christ broke that death. He destroyed it. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. F.F. Bruce says this, if the death of Christ is the supreme demonstration of the love of God, the resurrection of Christ is the supreme demonstration of his power. Christ is greater. He's great. He's greater than death. Greater, number two, than authority. Verse 21 far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. He's greater than all that. It doesn't just say above. Notice the key word there, far above. It doesn't just say he's a little bit better. No, he's so far above. He just, he's greater than all that. Any earthly institution, any heavenly beings, any demons, any angelic things that go around, any kind of authority, Christ is better. Christ is greater than all that. Why? Because he is God. 1 Corinthians helps us understand this. It says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority and power, for he must reign until all he has put all his enemies under his feet. That's King Jesus. That's the kingdom that you serve. You serve a greater kingdom. You serve a greater king. The, the earthly um, temptations don't match up at all with God's kingdom. We are bound before salvation, bound to the kingdom of darkness. And we were freed of that. Why should we look to that kingdom and say, I want to do that when you have a greater king to serve? Greater than what? Everything. Verse 21 continues, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Greater than every name. Jesus is greater than every name. Therefore, as Philippians 2 verse 9 says, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Jesus is greater. Whatever a name can be given to, let any name be uttered, whatever it is, Christ is above it, says commentator Marvin Vinson. He's greater than every name. Hebrews 1.4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inher inherited is more excellent than theirs. He's greater than every name. And then if that wasn't enough evidence for us, if that wasn't enough for us to fully comprehend, verse 22 and 23 says this, and he put what? 
all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all and in all church jesus is greater than us he's greater than the church he is the one in which our church which our church submits to he is the one in which our church brings all of the the, the sufficiency saying that jesus is sufficient christ is sufficient that jesus is above all he's greater than all and he's above us and he is the one the bible is the one in which we base all of our authority we find also in first corinthians 15 for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. All things. All things. As we look to close, I just want to summarize this brief chapter. This chapter briefly. There's so much in this chapter, chapter 1 of Ephesians, and it's fundamental. It's important for us to know what's in this first chapter so that when we get to the things in chapter 4, 5, and 6 about put this on, put this off, we understand the why. It's great for us to have this list of things. Oh, I should do this. I shouldn't do that. But now chapter 1 says the reason why. Why? Because Jesus is greater. His kingdom is better to serve than the kingdom of darkness. We shouldn't at all look to the kingdom of darkness for wisdom. We shouldn't at all look for the kingdom of darkness for knowledge. Why? Because Jesus is better. He's greater. The believers were show their spiritual blessings we find in verses 13 through 14 paul then begins to pray that the believers might come to know god more intimately verse 17 we find that it's necessary so that they can better appreciate their past calling to salvation verse 18 verse 19 through 21 talks about god manifests this power in the past in christ's resurrection and ascension and because of that he is great he is greater heavenly father lord as we seek your name as we know that your name is great as we understand your glory your power help us to have a deeper knowledge of you help us to gain wisdom that only you can give to us father we ask you to enlighten our hearts. We ask, God, that you will give us that wisdom so that we can know that you're greater. Lord, you are such a good God to us. And Father, we pray that as we close this service, that our church will understand that you're greater. That everyone here will know that you are greater. Greater than what? Greater than their sin. Greater than their past greater than all things that they've ever submitted to or subjected themselves to. God, we pray that you just be with us. Go before us now. Help us to live out the gospel this week, knowing that you are greater. Church, will you stand? Maybe there's something going on in your hearts and in your life today that you said, I don't know if Jesus is greater than that. I'm struggling with this fact. I ask that today, you just pull someone aside, or maybe where you are, as we sing this song in closing, that you'll say, Jesus is greater than my problems. Jesus is greater than whatever I'm trying to lift up or uphold. Jesus is greater. Listen as we sing. Jesus is greater, and he's got a wonderful name, and it's a beautiful name, and it's a powerful name. And... I hope I don't destroy you too much here, but God does not need you. He doesn't. He doesn't need you to be powerful. He doesn't need you to be creator of all things, but he wants you. He loves you. And even though we are separated by sin, even though our disobedience separates us from him forever, even in that, he says, I love you. And even in while we were still sinners, he loves us and he died for us. And he did that because he wants us with him forever. Jesus came to earth and he showed his power over sin and over death. And that is our inheritance forever.
a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Everything is yours. And God, we thank you for knowing that while we were still sinners, while we still are in disobedience, you saved us. You sent Jesus to die for us. Your power over sin and death gives us an inheritance, an eternal hope uh, that we live with you for eternity. Please remind us of that this week, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage us and embolden us and give us strength in all circumstances that we would have the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a blessed week.